and I just realized I forgot to start the recording, so I'm starting it now. And just a okay. reminder, um, sorry, I forwarded the slide as I did that. That's fine, yeah. Um, I'm Susan Smith. I'm the Director of Library Services at the Trinity River Campus, and I am a member of the Learning Commons Advisory Panel. And I'm excited um, to be here today to share with you ways that we can think about engaged learning in the library and learning commons. And first up, Bruni is going to talk a little bit more about the Active Learning Academy. OK, I think I, I skipped that one before, so I'm glad we have we get the chance to do it again. Um, so the Active Learning Academy. The vision is to increase the student success and the completion through the keyword that uh, we heard this uh, earlier is to be intentional as we develop um, interactive and integrative teaching techniques to use in the classroom. Um, and as it was mentioned earlier, we might think that lecture is just the best thing. That's how we learn. Why do we have to change what we do? But it also keeps us uh, updated and um, with what is new. Our, our students, they are being exposed to other forms of acquiring information and learning. And we need to, as a way to adapt and reach to them and to us too, that we will also learn uh, how our role can evolve or what can we add to what we already do. Uh, so the purpose is, again, is to enhance uh, their learning and um, the library, if we are, if it is in the library, I just, the visual changes that I have seen are the different groups and pods that are available for students to gather. And it was exciting to hear what else, other things are being added to provide them with the students with other places where they can interact with content and with others, although challenging during these times. So let's let me take control and go to the next slide. Um, let's see if I can go. OK, so in our next slide, I will be sharing briefly uh, the six strategies that are emphasized during the Active Learning Academy. Um, as a faculty member, I have to confess that we take a lot of math courses to learn about the content, but not as much as how to deliver the content. And um, during the academy, I was able to really emphasize the strategies that some of them I might not have known the name, but now I feel more comfortable with them. And the first one that is mentioned here, um, it is a scaffolding. Um, and it was, I used to ask the students, so tell me what do you know? Because it's good to know where you're at so that I know where I can take you. So if, if it is in a library setting, uh, they will say, I have to do this research. OK, so what do you know about it? What, how do you want to focus? What are the parameters? Do you have a handout? Uh, let's read it together. And it will be at the beginning, we'll be sorting out before you go search for the resources. What is it really that you want to work on? What is it? What is it that you are asked to do? And um, another technique, the next one, the classroom talk. It is, uh, is it? great technique where the students you create a space to where the students can articulate what they're thinking and it is where professors we can become facilitators and um anywhere they go on campus instead of providing them with the answer it's like answer their question with another question and they're like, I didn't want to, I did not. There might be some uh, students that will not appreciate that, especially in a math tutoring setting, um, but it is what will make them learn more how to interact with content. Uh, the writing to learn um, is, as it was mentioned earlier, it could be a debriefing. What did you learn today? What are the sticky points? What is it that you would like me to emphasize? And a reflection at the end of a session, um, 
and emphasizing the use of the vocabulary uh, in the classroom. Uh, in math, they might say, oh, that little, little number on top of that letter in the corner. And I'm like, well, that is called exponent. <laughs> so just emphasizing as they interact with content, you know it and because you see it as that. But these are the words you can emphasize vocabulary during the writing to learn. Uh, collaborative group work um, is one that during the Active Learning Academy sessions, I was doing a lot of collaborative work, but not really assigning jobs to each one of the students. Like one will be collecting the data, one will be presenting, what will be the one that will be moving, asking questions during this during the interaction of the group, that it should be not more than four students, ideally. And uh, questioning that Susan will elaborate on the type of questions, but just it, it provides the opportunity for the students to build content as they start with what do you know? OK, that's what is a fact. What else? What are the what could have happened if we did not have this situation? And that happens a lot in the math. What is it they're asking you? How would you know that it is a different type of question? What makes this question unique? Um, literacy groups. Um, that one is it increases the engagement. And one thing that I like to use at the beginning of class is give them them uh, discovery um, or just information on what is math anxiety. If you were to describe it personally, how does it feel? Do you think that you have it? And ex and also presenting them with links and uh, articles about math anxiety. Um, which seems to be very prevalent in mathematics classes. Um, so now we're going to pass it on to Susan. So the next part here is, oh, it stopped sharing. Let me give it back here. Um, is, is the engaged part of our breakout session. Um, you heard in the presentation earlier that we don't just talk about it, we don't just tell you about it, but we ask you to use some of the techniques while you are learning about them. So we are going to look at some questions now using a Google Doc, and I'm going to put the link in the chat so that you can get to that Google Doc. And the questions are, what are you currently doing that incorporates engaged learning? What could you do? And how can we work to coordinate engaged learning that happens inside the classroom and outside the classroom? So when a formal setting um, and, um, versus, say, when somebody comes from a class into the library, the Learning Commons. And I will also share the Google Doc so that you can see it while people are working on it. We're in the Aegean se session, so let me make sure I have the right one. And share that you can type um, whatever works for you if you want to type words phrases sentences um, if if you have thoughts about the questions towards the bottom you can start with the last question you don't have to start with the top give people a few minutes to think and, and type
You can, yes, more than one person should be able to type in the document at the same time. And if instead of having your own original idea, if you see some words or phrases that other people are typing that you think are really useful or interesting or they, that you would also do or you're also doing, you could highlight those. You could put an X next to the one that you really like. You could also um, sort of mark up what other people are doing in the document. But yes, it should let multiple people in there. That's the, the goal of the Google Doc is the collaboration aspect. And this is actually an activity that ties back to the um, classroom talk that we was just mentioned on the previous slide. You could use this in an online setting to do a form of classroom talk. I see a couple of people are still typing, but um, does anyone want to, um, June, if you want to just type anything in the chat, um, I can add it to the document if it's not letting you type. I don't know why, um, why it's not working um, for you. The same for anyone else. If, if it's for some reason it's not letting you type, if you put it in the chat, we'll see it. Does anyone want to say anything about what they wrote or anyone want to ask a question about what someone else has written? Anything that you can see or notice um, looking at the document based on what people have added? I um, saw that somebody said asking students why they chose something. I think that's great. But the second piece of what that person posted, and I don't know if the person wants to say who they were, but uh, asking them what else they could have done or what other choice they could have made and would it, would it have worked better if they had done something differently, I think is a really good question. Not just why did you do this, but why did you pick this instead of that? Um, that makes them have to think about 
what else they could have done because mo- many times there's multiple ways that you can go go about answering or or accomplishing a task anyone else see anything that jumps out at them One question that you wrote is, how can you know what is happening in the classroom? And um, I don't know if it is done on other campuses, but at the Southeast campus, um, we have librarians that they will come in during our uh, division meetings. And that is something that can also be done now if you're able to go uh, request to attend the different division meetings and they will come to us with the resources that are available for faculty to use and to send the students um, to the library and either to complete a project or just additional resources that the students can use. That is a great way to know or at least faculty know, oh, that resource is available. Let me see how can I incorporate that in the classroom. So I always appreciated uh, them coming. And then uh, if I wanted to do a project, how can I join them? How can they be part of what I'm doing? How can we collaborate in this together? It's also, because it's not just engaging the students, that's a way to engage faculty and staff with the different resources that we, we don't just have to use our just the textbook for our courses. I was just writing in the chat. I see Kenny was commenting that TR librarians do go to the department meetings, but I wonder um, I know that our many of our learning center staff go to department meetings, but I don't think our library technology managers really think about how they might fit in listening to conversations or hearing what um, faculty are talking about in department meetings. So that's a that's an interesting thought that somebody might stick in the back of their mind to mm-hmm. to ponder if that would be something that would be useful in the future. All right, I don't want us to run short on time, and I don't think anyone is still typing. I'm just going to look real quick. Um, So we are going to move to the next slide. So let me share this presentation again. Let's take a second for it to load, so bear with me. I totally need to learn more about Teams to know why it has to always load at the first slide instead of loading where I left off. I'm probably sharing it incorrectly. Yeah, me too. Another (laughs) more to learn. All right, here we are for our next activity. I know I learned that we had to. I think there was a plugin that had to be in the PowerPoint. Anyway, and that's why it's not displaying. So. Um, this is an activity that the original plan was to do a word cloud with Paul everywhere. Um, but apparently I did not download the plugin into the PowerPoint in order to flow. Anyway, so we're going to be having to use the chat and we are I'll read the instructions and they are identified um, using the word cloud feature, which is going to be using the chat feature. Um, to respond to the following prompts. Prompt, uh, identify the single word that captures the meaning of engaged learning for you without using the words engaged or learning. So we can just, um, I have the chat open so that we can uh, see your responses. So do not use the words engaged or learning And we have a single word, but if you have a compound word, that will be okay. Do not use the word engaged or learning.
So we see student focus, discussions, interactions. So what have you seen in your area that you will call it that you're already doing or what you have observed that you will classify it as engaged um, learning? Creative, correct. Active, yep. Exploration, I like that. Exploration. And that applies to everything. Inspiring, yes. It's like I shared this with my previous group um, that I have to say that my love for, for teaching math was really inspired or um, in during tutoring sessions. And that's why I tell the students, as I mentioned that we are in my classes, we ask them to go 15 hours a semester. I tell them do not go more than 15 hours because you might end up teaching. So keep it to 15. 16, you will be into a dangerous area. I just loved it so much. And I do have students that go more than 15 hours, but it is just such a great place to collaborate to. I will say to be yourself and in terms of messing up before you actually get, get assess, uh, an assessment in the topics. It's like, oh, wow, I'm glad I clarify that now. So it's a way to get inspired, to get feedback, to collaborate. Those learning places are the best ones, I will say. I'm a fan. And a product of that. Like in the mean. Actively participating. Yeah. And as we say, it doesn't have to be in uh, actual movement. It could be questioning each other, but do you know this? The practice, definitely. Practice. And some of our students are not really interested in practicing much, so it's emphasizing the value of it, what it has long-lasting results. So Kenny, how do you, uh, how would you say you have used, uh, is it practice, are you in the, physics department yep oh you're in the library okay wonderful So how have you used it in the library that you will identify now as being, is it um, either interacting with the students or is it a staff or faculty sharing? We're so quiet. We have a lot of computer folks here. Perhaps they're oh, used to looking okay. at their screens and not talking. <laughs> oh, okay, got it. Not to stereotype anyone, because actually I know a couple of people in this space that are very um, um, talkative. They're just not talking, and I don't want to call anybody out. Yeah. Because I happen to know you personally. <laughs> It's just the coffee that was uh, we had this morning might not have been that strong, right? Well, or maybe we need our booster, our coffee booster. We do, we do. <laughs> it has been a, a, a fairly involved morning, so I can understand, too. Even some people who are, are usually verbal and outgoing may be running out of steam at this point in the, the in session, the I know. Yeah. Um, I like the sharing. <laughs> A lot. I saw um, also um, inspiring that we talked about exploration. I think that's a wonderful word, creative. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes, you know, um, Bruni's talked about this a little bit. We have to work a little bit harder to get students to, to understand the reason for doing some of these activities and putting for some of this energy um, mm -hmm. into the work. Mm -hmm. 
um, because sometimes that we, as this happens in the library um, fairly often, people sort of show up and say, I need, as in, I need you to give this to me, <laughs> as yes. opposed to, I need you to show me how to do it, or I need to learn so I can do it myself next time. Yes. Yeah, I need, I, I need to I need to attach this do document to Blackboard. Uh -huh. not, I need to learn how to attach a file so I know how to do it in the future. And, and, and some of this is just helping students to reorient their attitude and their thought process. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any other words that they would like to share or even phrases that they like to share before we move on? So we'll continue with questioning. Yes, I'm getting the, the link there. All right, we're still in the Aegean session. Okay, so questioning. Um, what are the five types of questions? And I had to look up more information to make sure that I was giving you correct information. And interestingly enough, the first question is factual. So I had to go look up the answer to what are the five types of questions so that I could make sure I was giving you a factual answer. And a factual answer or a factual question is one where there is usually an accepted sort of very standard kind of answer and the five types of questions if you're wondering at least in our setting here are factual convergent divergent evaluative and combination so factual i think again that kind of makes sense convergent is usually where there may be um, a larger set of answers that are right, but it's fairly understood what the right answer is. So the example could be things like uh, reading an article and making sure that someone comprehended the content or reading a textbook and, and asking questions to, to, to gauge comprehension. Not just when did this happen, but um, perhaps um, what are their reasons behind or what are the steps for doing this? Or um, what happens? Can you analyze or, or give examples? Um, an example of a question like that might be if you read a story, what were the reasons the character acted a certain way? And so it's not going to necessarily be a sentence in the story. It says the reason the character made this decision is because that the student should be able to read the story and figure out from comprehending and understanding what was happening, they should be able to name the reasons. A divergent question allows students to um, create different alternative answers or variations. And instead of it being like um, an obvious or correct answer, there may be different degrees of correctness, or you may need to be able as a student or as the person um, questioning the student to ask them, how did you know? How did you get to this answer? Um, what, con what were the context or the clues that you used to figure that out? And actually, I think somebody put some of that in, um, in the document earlier, which is really great. Um, and then an evaluative question is, is almost like a, a really high um, level, higher order thinking type of question. So it might ask you not just to think about one subject or one piece of something that you're doing, but maybe to look across different subjects or different areas and compare and contrast. Or, um, for example, the one question that they used on the website I found that I thought was real interesting was, what are similarities and differences between Roman gladiatorial games and American football? And then finally, combination questions could use just just what it sounds like could be combinations of different types of questions. So you could ask someone for a fact and then ask them to take two facts 
and tell you how they're the same or different, for example. And that would be a combination question. And we have enough time. Last time we ran out of of time in the other session, but we have enough time to, to do a little bit of the activity. So um, the activity again is in the Google Doc that you're in before. If you just scroll down to the second page, it will show you, it'll ask you, and you can just put, um, um, you know, mark in the box your answer to the question. What kinds of questions do you use the most? What kinds of questions do you use the least? And which kinds of questions would you like to use more? I'm going to see if I can share that page. You can also type in the chat um, if that's easier. But you just need to say what you're answering. So what questions do you use the most? What do you use the least? And what would you think you would like to try to use more? And one of the things we talked about in the last session was some of this engaged learning is about practitioners. And actually, um, Rooney mentioned this on, on one of the first slides she talked about, learning more about what we're doing and why we're doing it and being very intentional and strategic, not just using group work, but using group work for a reason and understanding that setting up group work in a certain way um, makes it work better for the student to be successful and learn. Um, using questionings, questions in a way where instead of just, especially I think in computers, um, it might be easy to say, we're gonna ask a lot of factual questions, but what would a student learn from the experience with us if we were asking other types of questions? If anyone has some good examples of questions that they've used before, that would also be probably a great thing to share for your for your colleagues to see. I think what's interesting um, sometimes with these types of activities is to see where people have answered the same question almost um, opposite of each other. So I see, for example, in almost each area that, um, for example, some people say they use divergent a lot and some people would like to use it more. And the same thing for um, evaluative. Matter of fact, I would love it if somebody who uses evaluative questions in their work or has, has used them or thought about how they would use them would might share with a group because I think sometimes those can be tricky for us to, to, to think of if we haven't thought a little bit in advance um, about the kinds of interactions and questions that are um, things that students come to help or staff ask for help with. If anybody, you can type in the chat if you don't want to unmute yourself and talk. I, under, I understand. A great example is I see that someone has marked evaluative in every, use the most, use the least, and want to use more. So I see that in every 
um, under every question evaluative is coming up. I think about it in the sense of maybe with computers, once somebody learns some things on a computer, how does how does it the same or different if they move to a different software or um, not that I'm really good at moving from a from a Windows computer to a, a Mac computer, but what is this what is the same and different? Um, how would you explain to someone who only used a Windows computer how to use a Mac computer? Maybe that's a question that you could ask a student that would require them to do some evaluation. Um, how would you tell someone maybe what types of, if they told you what they needed to do with the computer, what type of computer or software they would need? That's an evaluation kind of question maybe. What else? Anything else? Looks like people are mostly done with that activity. Anyone have any questions they'd like to ask based on what they see on the screen that maybe their colleagues might chime in? What what kind of question is it? I don't know if it would be a question of fact or a question of evaluation. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the things that we often deal with, I know pretty much everybody who helps students on computers, whether they're whether it's a computer question or a, a research question or just a navigating the web question. Um, there are times when um, when someone will will say, hey, I'm on I'm on my teacher's website, but I can't figure out how to do this. The teacher said to go go and click on this and do this. Here's some some action they're supposed to do. But I don't see anything on the page that says that. And of course, what do we do? We walk over, we glance at the screen and we see this, you know, outlined in giant blaring blinking lights, this understanding of this is the thing they're supposed to click on. How do I get them to see this is the thing they're supposed to click on? Because it's immediately obvious to us. So <clears throat> there are a lot of times that we end up trying not to just read the screen to them, but ask them questions like, hey, uh, well, do you see anything on the screen do you see any words on the screen or what words do you see on the screen that might be related to uh, submitting an assignment or related to um, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech or, or something like that? Is that a question where you're asking them a factual question as in they're identifying a fact based on the information on screen or are they evaluating the content in order to determine which parts of that content are re relevant to them? I think that's a combination question. If if I'm, I mean, and th these thinking about questions in this way is really new to me. I mean, I've, I've used questions in my whole library career, but thinking about questions is really new to me. So I'm just going from my, what I understand, that you were both asking them kind of a factual question, like, tell me what you see, but then you're also asking them to make a, a judgment call or to, to, to try to say this is better than that or this is different from that. So I think that's kind of a combination, especially okay. when you're talking about, um, say, for example, on a database where people have results or on a website um, or like on a web search where they're trying to pick from what they search something out that they think is, is relevant. Right. And yeah, it's definitely hard because sometimes you just want to take the, the short five minute answer and say, it is right here. <laughs> the yeah. button you need to push. Yeah, I, I think I think everybody who works in a library, I mean, at least once a day, you you will you're you're sitting there and you're you're watching as the student scrolls right past the thing that they need because they have not successfully identified that that's the thing they need, and you know it. And you have to you, you have that moment in yourself of okay, well, how much time do I have? How much time is the student likely to take? Um, how, how do I go back and and take them back 20 years to childhood and show them, you know, start at in, in English, start at the top left and work your way down and to the right, lo actually look at each item, identify it, connect the semantic meaning to it, and then evaluate from that 
set of objects the one that you need you we we watch that happen all the time where they say well i don't see where to do that and i mean the words are almost right there they're just right there i think and there's a asking um, asking the right questions so that they have that kind of helen keller aha moment of connecting oh this particular handshape is the word water is the feeling of water is the sensation of water you know making that connection for them uh that those kinds of questions get to be really complicated it can be i think i think going back to something you said just a moment ago sometimes you have to balance the amount of time and and how busy the library is and other things in order to to really be able to do that but hopefully um, one of the things I often do, especially with students who are super rushed, is as I, I will, will um, give them as much as I can and then emphasize to them, and actually Bruni has talked about this with math, that waiting till the half an hour before your class and your paper is due to ask for assistance is not the best way to do this process. And, and here is a way to get you started, but you really need the next time you have a paper assignment it, you know, and, and it doesn't work for every student. Some students are just constant procrastinators or constant rush, 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 rush around. But occasionally you can connect with a student and get them to sort of see. So it's definitely a process. And, and I think the biggest thing can be for us as practitioners to, to try to be a little bit reflective on our practice. And maybe um, one of the suggestions from one of the groups we did before was maybe um, in in a staff meeting or in the case of, of the people in this call, maybe um, if you guys have started to meet a little more regularly or if you want to start to meet regularly, you can, can have a time in a meeting where you might address a, a question or something that someone's come up with that's a real question, like the student asked this, how would you handle it? And, and sort of have a you know a five or ten minute conversation where people can share what they might do or what they what what really happened. Especially it can be useful sometimes. It's hard to sometimes admit when things didn't go well, but when it didn't go well, when the student walked off because they were so frustrated with you. <laughs> Not you, me. When they walked off because they were frustrated with you taking too long to answer their question because they didn't want to do the learning part. <laughs> so true. Um, we just have a minute or two before we're going to um, go back. So let me get back to the PowerPoint. If there are any questions you have, that was a great question, Andrew. Um, if the, it will let me get back to the PowerPoint. Not that it really matters at this point. It's mostly just wrapping up here. Um, any other questions for us or each other? Before we go back to the general session, and you'll be back in the same session you were in when you started this morning. So you'll leave this meeting and go back to the live event just to give you a reminder. You might still be connected to that room, to that meeting. I think it might still be part yeah, of Yeah, if you things. didn't leave the meeting, then you should uh -huh. still be connected and you might see it somewhere on your screen. Speaking of seeing things on your screen, mine says 2020 Learning Commons and hold and it gives I have a, a, a play is to re-enter the meeting and I have a hang up as if I want to leave so that's what I have on my screen speaking of that okay. but any other questions or comments before we get back to the the closing session there it went fast thank you so much thanks everybody so we um the the final wrap up starts at about 12 so you have about nine minutes if you need to again have take, lunch take a break oh yeah eat, eat a very fast lunch of course we're exactly. going to finish at 12 30 so you can also just be like okay i'll eat when we're done yeah um <laughs> that is true take a break you know run to the facilities get a snack get a drink of water whatever you need to do all right okay thank you so much thank you. bye Bye.